You're listening to Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. Hi, it's Lisa Birnbach. Welcome to Five Things That Make Life Better. I just want to reiterate the title because our guest was unclear, even though he knew he was here and he knew he wanted to be here, I take it. Um, That guest is Jesse Kornbluth, the writer, but not just the writer. I think he has been writing since he graduated from college in the 20th century. He's been a staff writer or contributing editor of Vanity Fair and everything glossy and architectural digest and L decor. And he created, and AOL, weren't you the content? I was uh, the editorial director. Well, which is uh, like being a tabletop. That's very funny. So you were at AOL and you created a wonderful website called Head Butler, which I sometimes consult for tips at headbutler.com. But you're here with your new book, which is the most intriguing confection and concoction that I have read in a long time. It's called JFK and Mary Meyer, A Love Story. And it is based on the actual romance. It, it's You have invented, you have fleshed out the character, the mysterious character of Mary Meyer, the long-recognized mistress of President JFK, from what, from research and from talking to people who knew her. And if I'm correct, there was, it was well known amongst people who followed this story because she was murdered in very uh, mysterious, it's a cold case actually, right? She was murdered after the president was killed in Dallas. No one knew how, no one one ever solved the case. Her sister was married to Ben Brantley, the editor-in-chief of the Washington Post. It was just a society murder, very mysterious. President Kennedy, Camelot, Jackie Kennedy, and she had allegedly, I don't even need to interview you. I can do the whole thing myself. She had kept a diary, which her sister, I believe, burned when she found it at her house. And you have reconstructed her diary. Reimagined. Uh, Thank you. You have reimagined her diary and written a, a, a diary, which is a novel which is a dream, which was felt as a reader like I was in a dream state. And I am going to let Jesse Kornbluth talk about it after this. Okay, now, Jesse, now that I've really told the whole story, you've assumed a woman's voice in this book in a very believable, credible amazing way. How'd you do that? It was easy. I mean, I've all my friends are women. Uh, a writer's position is basically female because you're a supplicant in most, most uh, relationships. And also, uh, I knew women like her. I was, you know, a little Jewish kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia who moved to New York and suddenly found himself in Milton Academy outside of Boston where the Kennedys went and T.S. Eliot and, you know, really, really old Boston people went. And lots of the girls I knew there were like young Mary Pinchot. And then on Saturdays after sporting events in the gym, uh, mothers would serve tea out of real china out of, uh, you know, silver tureens. And I had the most intense crushes on the mothers who were models for Mary Pinchot Meyer. And I knew peripheral Kennedy people. And also, I was of the age. I mean, I was 18 years old when Kennedy was killed. So this was the really the central national trauma of everybody's life, but certainly of mine. And so I had a, a really strong emotional connection to these people. But uh, writing a woman, I, you know, I never thought it was difficult. Uh, and I, I really, I liked her a lot. I miss writing her. I am so happy not to be writing Jack Kennedy, who was whatever his uh, skills as a politician and uh, his, his charm as a leader, was a sex addict, unbelievably sick, irretrievably sick, and uh, personally doomed. 
Let's stop for a second. I was in, I think, first grade when Kennedy was shot. So I never knew about Mary Pinchot Meyer at the time. Nobody did. Well, I heard my mom talk about her. I mean, I think it wasn't like Stormy Daniels and Trump, but I think there was an undercurrent of people who knew of her. It was an inner circle conversation. But of course, what you get to very quickly is the fact that because her ex-husband was CIA and because she was bright and unfulfilled in so many ways, she spent a great deal of her time in your imagining trying to figure out whether there was one shooter or more of her lover in Dallas. Only in the last year, uh, what she was really trying to figure out was her own life and her own relationship to Kennedy for the, for the first two and a half years. The thing is, uh, this is the strangest book I've ever written because it has uh, been published with a lot of velocity and a lot of approval and a lot of feedback, and it's, it's launched fast and, and enthusiastically. And because I'm also a screenwriter and a playwright, and because I wrote a diary rather than a sequential novel, which has become a very dull form the way it's generally practiced, uh, you can read it in an hour and 15 minutes. And so what happens is people are very excited reading it. They kind of forget that it's a tragedy, that someone was killed here and that someone was arrested and someone was acquitted and that it's it's unknown and that, you know, 10 months after her lover is killed by persons basically unknown, uh, she was killed by person or persons unknown. And she's like uh, collateral damage to the larger trauma. But now she's have, having a kind of moment. But the moment is a pleasurable reading experience, and that's ironic. It is ironic. And honestly, in the beginning of your book, I felt like I was, I don't know, sort of condoning a charade. And by the end of it, I missed her. I really grew to like her, to feel for her. I guess I was mad at you at the beginning for concocting her and conjuring up this woman without really her DNA. And then by the end of it, I just, you know, I had become very fond of her. I felt sorry for her. I felt she was, you know, terribly misunderstood and wondered if she ever spent any time with her kids. But of course... I kept her kids out of it because they're alive and nobody else is. And I just felt they needed to be exempt. And there's that funny theme that comes over and over every New Year's Day, her resolution is to spend more time with her kids. So that was kind of a sweet little... She wasn't a bad mother, given the climate. But here's really the larger thing, and I'm not the first writer to say this. There is no fiction. There is no history. There's no biography. There's only memoir. I'm Mary Meyer. The book's entirely about me. Right. And it's about... And, and that's why it's a love story, because I came to a point in my life in 2014 or so uh, where I was finishing a novel called Married Sex, colon, A Love Story. Here's another book, A Love Story. Love stories are what I write. I'm really interested in two people in a room. This book had three people, had Jackie, and it has a fourth person called The Footnotes, which is me, actually right. me. But... Uh, you know, I, I, I look at other people's work and they've got five, six, seven characters, multi layers back going back and forth. You know, my heroes are like James M. Cain, who wrote, you know, hard boiled novels that are 142 pages, which he said are love stories. Right. Oh, interesting. So, interesting. so yeah, because love generally doesn't go right, right? And uh-huh. so, uh, and I'm just really interested in human relations. The thing that people don't tell you, that's the thing I want to know. Now, how much research did you do? 150 books. Okay. But I didn't read them all, right, because I know what to look for. I mean, I've done this rodeo several times. You know, there are two books about Mary, and I certainly read those. She's in, you know, other people's books. I mean, and some really good writers, Sally Bedell Smith in particular. And then I was just looking for important dates of the Kennedy administration to make a timeline. But there's still people, or when you started this book anyway, there were still people in Washington and here probably who knew her, had known none, her. I talked to none, to, to none of them. Ah. Not interesting. interested. Not, ah, interesting. 
And because uh, because at this point they're eighty, ninety years old. Yeah. I just don't trust their memories. I get it. I get it. Did you surprise yourself as Mary? Were you surprised by how rigorous your Mary was in doing research about the president's murder? See, I was because no, because she's me. Right? Yeah, that's right. what I do. I mean, at Vanity Fair, I was one of the highest paid journalists in the world. And the way that works is Those were the days. when people pay you too much, you want to show that you're worth it. So I made every phone call. I read everything. I made briefing books. I mean, we all did. It was like playing on the 1927 Yankees. And so uh, I knew so much about her world and about Washington society and... I had been to those Deb parties, for God's sake, that it, was, it wasn't hard to write. You know, when a scene is hard to write, it means you shouldn't write it. <laughs> what was interesting to me as a different kind of woman from Mary Pinchot Meyer was how her life, as she got involved more deeply and deeply with the most important man in the world, her life got very small. And I think when you have a secret, mm. you have to shrink your world so that you don't give it away. You keep it inside a small circle. But your Mary wasn't a girl's girl at all. Not at all. And she had really only her sister and one other friend to confide in. in I'm saying, I know... She had multiple lovers. Yes, yeah, she had multiple she lovers. She was a, a really kind of a, a pre-feminist rebel. Uh, you remember, the Feminist Mystique was published in 1963, at the end of her life. Uh, before that... Women were really property, and uh, you know, men ran the show. And so, one of the things she felt, and this was her friendship with Tim Leary, and one was wonderfully naive, that if powerful women married to even more powerful men took LSD with their husbands, the men would see that peace and disarmament and racial harmony was the better way. Okay, so the idea that. President Kennedy's lover had went on LSD trips at Harvard with Timothy Leary. Is there any possibility that that's true? It wasn't at Harvard. She took LSD in, in upstate uh, New York. Uh, uh, but no, she she took she, if she took it, it was in California in about fifty nine or sixty. You know, the literature is not reliable, and on on this matter, I particularly don't trust it. You know, people say, oh, she took LSD with Kennedy. Yeah, dubious. Did she smoke weed with Kennedy? It's in several books. Six joints? God, that stuff must have been wretched. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. uh, that's right. They smoked six at once. As As one does. As Gertrude Stein would say, very interesting if true. (laughs) Yes. But uh, no, Mary was the only female friend he really had. Kay Graham has said that until her husband died, Jack looked right through her. Oh, interesting. And he let Mary, invited her to sit in the Oval Office during the day because he had no woman in the cabinet. He was a terrible misogynist. He couldn't remember the names of his lovers. Uh, He took the virginity of a 19-year-old intern on her fourth day at the White House on his wife's bed. Um, So... Uh, And that is true from what we know. She got a million dollars for her book. Right. Yeah, no, Mary was, as I, I, in the book he says, Mary, I trust you. I want you to be my beacon light. And this was somewhat true. I think she was a very steadying influence. And then later she felt enormous guilt because if he was killed for political reasons, for advocating, you know, peace and disarmament, Uh, If he was killed basically for the speech he gave at American University, a speech that Mary could have delivered, then she felt like she was a contributor to his death. And that's, nothing is heavier. Nothing, nothing. But I have to pinch myself and remind me that this is a work of fiction because that may be the case or may not. So one night, uh, you know, my girlfriend lives 36 miles from here. So the weekdays are, are, are grim often. And at 9.30 at night, I feel sorry for myself. And, you know, I take a shot of bullet and I just open a file and turn on music and I just write. And I wrote this thing and it was everything I think, but I put it in Mary's voice. And I call my girlfriend and 
read it to her and she said, well, that's her death warrant. She's signing her death warrant there. And I thought, how lucky am I to be doing this as fiction? Because to say, you know, it's fixed. It's been fixed forever. It's never going to not be fixed. These people control it. They're really powerful. And the, and they're going to do whatever they need to do to stay in power. That's really depressing. And uh, it it's sort of hard to live your daily life full of hope and resolution and raise children if you think the fix is in. Yeah, uh, yeah, it would be. Well, so in a way, oh, this is a terrible thing maybe to say, but this version of Mary Pinchot Meyer's life with President Kennedy is a tiny bit like a Tarantino reimagining of the Sharon Tate murders minus the Sharon Tate murders. I mean, yes, Mary comes to a very sad and explosive end, but until that point, she is allowed to have the president fall in love with her. And Almost. she oh, well, he told her once she was the He was old, full of it. He wasn't going to leave his wife for right. her, and she wasn't going to let him do it. He was just dreaming. In your book, in her diary, she says that Jack says to her or to someone, he needs to have sex every three days. That must have been a thing that he told somebody. He told Harold Macmillan. Oh, the prime minister. Yeah. And it was often uh, more than that. I mean, <sighs> Angie Dickinson said that... Uh, Jack Kennedy was the most exciting seven minutes of her life. <laughs> right, I mean, he was I read a that. terrible lover. He w always had to be on his back because of his bad back. Uh, he didn't know anyone's name, and he didn't care about her pleasure. Right. So uh, the only the only benefit, right, for the woman is to be able to say, "I slept with Jack Kennedy," because in terms of uh, satisfaction, that wasn't that wasn't even a factor. In one of the scenes, I think Mary asks him to open his eyes so he at least registers that he's with her. She says, Jack, pretend you love me. <laughs> he really can't. He really can't. Do you think that the publication of your book, and as you say, she's having a moment, is there any way the case will be reopened? No. Is there? There's no way because there's no body and there's no evidence. I mean, no Jack evidence. Kennedy would be 90 years old. I mean, this is so done. I mean, they arrested someone, a 135-pound black man. Um, that he did it uh, is extremely unlikely. Uh, a man named Peter Janney spent 30 years investigating this, and he believes that uh, the witness to the murder, uh -huh. a jogger who was jogging miles from his job at, at noon. Uh, several identities later, he uh, finds, tracks him down, and he feels that guy was connected to the CIA, and if anything, perhaps he was the shooter. Because it was, it had all the, the markings of a hit. You shoot someone in the head and you shoot someone in the heart. That looks too good for an amateur in the middle, middle of the day. Yes, at noon. At noon on a very open... On the towpath in Georgetown. The towpath. I mean, Come on. It doesn't get preppier than that, really. It's, uh, yeah, and, and that's the thing that's shocking. I mean, I once wrote a book with a, a mafia guy, and he said, always commit crimes in broad daylight, right, because you can get away with them easier because no one's expecting it, right? That's my motto. <laughs> what? Crimes in broad daylight? Yes, of course. Is that the motto of the podcast? Too? No, no. <laughs> It's five things that make life better. I told you. I told you. Um, I want to say, Jesse, that I was very much looking forward to talking to you because we've talked, but we don't really know one another, but we kind of do. And We're in the I've, same handful. We're in the same we, sprinkling. We're in the same sprinkling. I guess that's right. I just want to say that when... President Kennedy was shot in Dallas. I went to a little girl's school on the east side of New York, and the really nice plastic plates were light blue, and the majority of the plastic plates in our lunchroom were an ugly brown, and within about a week, those were called Oswald's, and the blue plates were called Kennedy's. I know. I know. It's profound. <laughs> it is profound. You know, I wonder when we will have a president who will capture the uh, greater emotions in Americans. I wonder if that's possible in the next. I'm writing a speech for her because I can't not, because I also write speeches. But, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll print it as an open letter because 
I'm never going to be hired to write this speech. And when you say her, is it one in particular or either? No, it's one in particular. It's it's one of the women that the Times endorsed. Yeah, that's yeah. It. that seems fair. And of course, now they're all picking her apart because uh, because they're all pundits and geniuses. I read that pundits and geniuses are often the least prescient of any of us who try to figure out what's going to happen next. Yeah. One of the useful things I've been doing recently is I, I, I've been forcing myself to talk to guys, and I ask them about politics. Oh, what do you make of that? Well, they're really happy with their portfolios. Yes, yes. Because they think they're talking to a guy. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> actually, I'm a woman in disguise in that conversation. So uh, Yeah, who knew? Who uh, knew? It must be dreamy being married to them. <laughs> <laughs> well... Uh, yeah, I've only made that that I've only had that experience once. I'm I'm <laughs> relatively untried. The, f- the first one's free, as drug dealers say. Oh, that's very nice. It's a mulligan. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jesse, give us your five great things that make your life better, if well, you can. My daughter's seventeen, and these are the last days of her being home. And one of the things I've learned is. If you sit across a table from a kid, you get nothing. Kids like parallel talk. So I now, although it's only 20 blocks away, I drive her to school. And before I drive her to school, I squeeze orange juice for her and give it, and she puts it in her backpack. And sometimes it's like a board meeting in 10 minutes. And mostly, though, we listen to her music. Uh huh. And it's really useful for me to listen to rap because you get such great lines. Like my favorite is, my lawyer says it's urgent, going to call him in an hour. <laughs> and I love my competition. I wish I could bring it back so I could kill it again. <laughs> and she wrote a book of poems. Oh. And I, I read them and I, 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 the title jumped out at me. She hadn't titled it, but it was perfect because she's influenced by rap and it's 110 pounds of resentment. And, wow. And I thought, as I said, you know, you write better at 17 than I wrote at 17, 18, or 19. And I was professional then. So, yeah, driving my daughter to school, that's like the, the day goes downhill after that, whatever happens. Honestly, I used to drive my kids to school, too, because I would at least feel like uh, we were – that was a bonding time, even though they would get very upset with me if I appeared to be clapping to music, because that's embarrassing, or singing along with the radio, because that's embarrassing, even with the windows up. I but vote with was, your children. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> really? A2. What were you thinking? Yeah, what was I thinking? <laughs> but it was very nice time to see them, and – and, yeah, you don't get that chance again. Well, there's a line in someone's poem. It says, a daughter is her father's heart walking away on feet. Aw. So. Okay. Yeah, this is a sentimental year for you, senior year. That's tough. She'll be home on summers, uh, during the summers, and she'll be home <laughs> for holidays, and she'll still, maybe she'll move back home and ask you for money for years and years. I asked her Maybe once, she'll resent you when I, she's 110, 11 pounds. I once asked her, if I died suddenly, would you miss me? And she said, not immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting, if true. Yeah, well, you make your own monster. We did. <laughs> <laughs> okay, number two. Well, I like real books. I mean, I don't read Kindles. I, I don't like t- to stream stuff. I like real movies in theaters. I like movies with subtitles. I like Turner classics uh, because there are great lines in these thirties movies: "A superior champagne from a, a superior fortune from an inferior champagne." <laughs> Oh, that's People don't wonderful. write like that. No, that sounds like Preston Sturgis or somebody. Yeah. You know, I've never used a Kindle, but I also like turning a page and writing on it. And a know. Kindle gives you homework, right? And then you have this inventory of stuff that you have to get to. It's like remedial reading. Oh. And uh, yeah, not interested. Also, I mark books. I once did a piece about Michael Crichton, and he had moved into this house, and they had to. Uh, reinforce the floor because he had five tons of books because he marked them too. Well, I marked mine too, but not, you know, he was also about 6'8", right? 
Yeah, he could get to the top shelf. <laughs> That's a luxury. Number three. Um, I like the off season. I like going anywhere when the traffic is going the other way. Do you have a great off season story? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because my new thing actually is really the last thing. My favorite thing is whatever I'm writing now, whatever I'm about to write. And I've been really lucky. Uh, the Mary Meyer book is being acknowledged as some sort of good piece of writing. I feel I've been writing above my talent for a bit. <laughs> I feel that it's a streak. Streaks can end. And so um, I am really I look forward to getting up and walking 10 feet and going to the desk. And um, I have a lot of focus now, which... Uh, and as you get older, you realize you have less time. So everything sort of works in the favor of me just working my ass off. Have you ever had a writer's block? No, you just put your checking account balance on top of the uh, screen and it, it, it sobers you very quickly. It's so interesting that men see writing as an income producing job. You mean More as than... opposed to me driving an Uber? I mean, what no, are we talking? No, I know, but it's interesting because I I have risked not earning money in my life. Uh, you know, if I did have a, a, a multi-year uh, block and I had to find other ways to compensate for it. You had royalties from a mega bestseller. Well, you know, they only last so long. And, but I found other kinds of jobs because I felt I wasn't writing at my at my best and I wasn't inspired to Look, write. writing is a business. I mean, you can pretend it's not. But if you get a big advance and it doesn't earn back and you have a new book, you're not going to get anything. So I'm surrounded by people who are artists, right? And they say, oh, when I finish a book, and they go off into some woo-woo stuff. And I say, when I finish a book, I look for the check because it needs to work artistically and it needs to work in the world. Yeah, it does. In the best, in the in, and when you're successful, it does. And when you're not... Paul Simon told me that all celebrity means is you get your calls returned. That's my ambition, getting my calls returned. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesse, thank you so much for being with me. It has been really fun talking to you and your alter ego, Mary Meyer, who looks very much like you. Yeah, if she were Jewish and Russian. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's time for my five things. Number one. I like that my iPhone, or maybe I should give credit to AT&T, notifies me when a telemarketer is calling and screens my spam calls. I appreciate it. Number two, the play Inheritance. It's a two-part play. It's on Broadway till this Sunday. It is a whirlwind three hours and 15 minutes that I saw of rage, hilarity, despair, poetry, humor, about gay men in 2017, and the writing and direction are incredible. Number three, even better than seeing Inheritance on Broadway was seeing it two rows behind Pete Buttigieg and his husband Chasten. When the lights rose, I looked over and I said, Buttigieg? And I sped over to them and chatted with them. I've never been pushier, except there was a woman who kept saying, are you sure you're not free for dinner? That pushy I was not. Uh, it was very exciting to see him. And uh, of course, I did invite him to join us on the podcast. Number four, writing assignments. I'm writing a couple of feature stories. And gosh, I love doing that. It's still interviewing, but it's a different pleasure when you're not worried about where you're standing or how close you are to the mic, and it just changes the experience, and I, I love writing. And number five, two of my exhibits are celebrating their birthdays this week, Exhibit A and Exhibit C, both interesting, wonderful, vibrant, intelligent people, and I'm always happy to celebrate good things. 
You've been listening to Five Things That Make Life Better with me, Lisa Birnbach. My guest this week has been Jesse Kornbluth, author of JFK and Mary Meyer, A Love Story, published by Skyhorse Publishing. You can follow Jesse on Twitter at Jesse Kornbluth or his website at jessekornbluth.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and rate and review us. That's the key on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Every positive review helps new listeners find us. My blog is at lisabernbach.com where you'll find links and photos, including the one of Mayor Pete and Chastin and me, and all the things that we talked about. This podcast is produced in New York City by thefieldtv.com. My engineer is Kevin Watkins. My team is Spresso Arucci, Michael Port, Boko Haft, and Sam Haft. Until next week, wash your hands and act natural. Bye-bye. That was Five Things with Lisa Birnbach. New episodes every Friday, if she remembers.